Hey everyone, I'm Claire, your Kids Director here at Hamilton Hills Church. Thanks for listening to this message today. You know, we have a saying around here, life is messy, everyone is welcome, and anything is possible. I don't know about you, but life sure is messy and exhausting most of the time. But no matter where you are in life, no matter what you're dealing with, we want you to feel welcome and loved here at Hamilton Hills. We hope you're encouraged by listening to the teaching today. Our prayer for Hamilton Hills is that everyone will learn how to hear God's voice and be confident that God hears our voice too. We firmly believe that we have a next step that God is leading us to. So what's yours? One last thing we want to encourage you in is generosity. We believe that God helps us grow in our faith when we take a part in the simple act of giving. Giving to your local church is an important act of worship. If you would like to do that today, visit the hamiltonhills.org Give tab. Let's listen to the message that God has for us today. Enjoy. We are just ending our series, Kingdom of God, or Upside Down Kingdom. And uh, I don't know if, if you've ever Googled the world's smallest kingdom is the kingdom of Tavala. I think that's right. Kingdom of Tavala. I have it in my notes, but I, I didn't have the table up here to put my, my thing down and then look it up. But the kingdom of, there it is right there. And uh, in, the, in the background, that's actually the island of Sardinia. It's where all the sardines live. And um, the kingdom is actually this little island right here. It's about two square miles and has 57 residents. So it's the world's smallest kingdom. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that's, if that's exactly true. But uh, there's another island on Lake Victoria in, uh, in between Kenya and Uganda. And I don't know if you've heard of this before, but they, they, it's like a dispute between the two um, countries of who owns this island. It's a, get this, you ready for this? A half acre sized island, a half acre. And um, it's super small. It has 157 people living on this island. There's a dispute between who owns the island. They say no one, and they refuse to allow Kenya or Uganda to fly the flag. They, have, they say that they're their own kingdom, and they have their own king, their own rule and law. So go ahead and put, uh, the, here it is, you ready? Here's the island. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, there's a, a hotel, believe it or not, on there, um, there's a, a, an office or like a, what you call like a town, a town square. There's a, a courthouse. There's an entire community that lives on the island. And so we've been talking through the upside down kingdom or the kingdom of God. It's mentioned over a hundred times in the New Testament. It's talked about by Jesus more than anything else he talked about. Money, uh, sin, uh, doing good works. Any, more than anything, he talked about the kingdom of God. And so we spent the last five weeks looking at the upside down kingdom, how it's completely different than any other kingdom. And we've looked at the five essentials of any kingdom and how it's upside down in the kingdom of God. First was uh, every kingdom needs a king. And our king is King Jesus. He's unlike any other king uh, that has ever ruled. The way he took office or the way he became king is not naturally how you become king. And every kingdom we do is every kingdom has a rule and authority. Every kingdom uh, has a, a, a people and we are the people. Uh, remember that one where the open the doors and there's all the people. Uh, someone came up to me after that message. Uh, just so if you missed that week, we started off the message with, uh, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up, and where's all the people? And then you like open it up, and there's all the people. Anyone following? No? Okay. All right. And then what, what ended up happening was someone came up and says, man, you corrected that from, for years. I thought it was, um, here's the church, here's the steeple, open up the church, where are all the people? Go down the street, hit the bar, and like open something, there they are. It was like... <laughs> It was the craziest thing. I was like, I've never heard that in my entire life. They're like, yeah. I was like, well, all right. Um, that's where, and that's where all the spring breakers are right now that aren't here at Hamilton Hills. And then last week we talked about every kingdom um, has a law and we looked at the upside down law of God. And today we're gonna talk about land. Every kingdom needs land. So what's a kingdom without the land in the kingdom? And I love this uh, this week, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, what makes this island here, Ming, it's called Megingo. 
the island of Megingo, is not what country rules them or even necessarily the people on this is the resources of this island. It happens to be right in a perfect place where the Nile perch come. And so they're able to harvest Nile perch and it's a great resource for that land. And so we're going to talk about why land is important is because of the resource and not to get into much like deep theology here, but when Jesus came and ripped the veil in the temple on his death, he let his spirit become available to us. And so now the temple is within us and we are, wherever we are is where the land is. And so we are going to look at that. Uh, We've been looking through the book of Matthew and studying the kingdom of God through the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew or Matthew's account of Jesus's life. And so we're going to end this series with one of the very last words that Jesus says, one of the last verses in Matthew. He is telling all of his disciples that he is giving them a new uh, instructions. He's now releasing them out into the world. And he has died, uh, been buried for three days, and now has rose again. And he says this in verse 18, Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples... I have been given all authority. Why was he given all authority? Because he was the king. He was King Jesus with a rule in heaven and on earth. Here's what's awesome or, or, or what we need to learn about the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God was heaven coming to earth. And so we are living in a world where we are bringing heaven to earth through Jesus Christ. Uh, Is the kingdom of God now or is it later? Yes, the kingdom of God is at hand, but it is also coming. And the more that we can spread the good news of Jesus and the more uh, that we uh, can build his kingdom, and we'll look at this in just in a couple of moments, then there'll be more heaven on earth. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying to his disciples, you're a disciple, which means you've learned from me. Now I'm releasing you. Go and make disciples. Reproduce yourself. Who you are, now reproduce and make disciples of all the nations. You ever heard the the term good news, the good news of Jesus Christ? Well, the, the good news was every nation, now there was an access that hadn't been there before, a unique access to the kingdom of God. In fact, when Jesus came and he started his ministry, what he said was, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand or is near. Uh, here's how I'd illustrate that. If you were to come over Denise and I's house, Obviously, because she invited you, because I I wouldn't invite you. No, I would. But if she invited you over the house, and and you come over to the Thistle's house, you'd walk in, and on your right would be our sitting room. And she would lead you in, and then you'd look on our right, and the next room would be our living room. And to the left is our kitchen and our dining table. And she would say, as she often does when we have company, she, she would extend her hand, and she'd say, the dining room is at hand. She doesn't say that, but she could. And that wouldn't mean that the dining room wasn't there before. It wouldn't mean that the dining room will be there after you're gone. It means the dining room is available. You now have access. And so when Jesus came and said, the kingdom of God is at hand, he wasn't saying it wasn't there before. He wasn't saying it will come one day. He was saying, you now have access to the kingdom of God in a way that has never been um, accessible before. It's now for Jew, Gentile, for poor, for rich, for male, for female. Everybody now has a unique access to the kingdom of God. And so he says, I want you to replicate yourself. I want you to make more image bearers of God. We were created in God's image. And it's interesting, in Genesis chapter 1, there's almost the very same instructions in a different way. Can we look at Matthew, or I'm sorry, not not Matthew, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. says, then God blessed them, speaking of Adam and Eve. And he said, what? Be 
fruitful and what? Multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. In other words, he was saying previous to sin, before there was enmity between God and man, before there was separation between God and man, the command from the very, very beginning was spread the kingdom of God. Multiply, fill the earth, govern it. Let there be more image bearers of God all over the earth. Then with sin, there was brokenness. And so through Jesus, we can now fill the earth, govern it, multiply, be fruitful so that the land can be covered by people that have given their allegiance to King Jesus. Here is the problem. The problem is you cannot reproduce something that you are not. I get excited when I hear that great commission, go therefore into all the world, every nation, baptize them, make more disciples. And on Sunday, I love getting up and saying, all right, here we go. We are going to be on mission for God. And I'm the type of guy that if you give me a mission, I'm going to give it 110%. I don't do something halfway. I mean, I'm the type of guy that when I first learned that the mission was go and, and, and tell people about Jesus so they can know about him and make him a king and he can save them. I'm like, let's go. Uh, and, if, and if our opposition is hell, give me a squirt gun. Let's charge. But you cannot re reproduce something that you are not. So if he says that we are supposed to go into all the world and make disciples, Sometimes if we're frustrated that maybe the mission isn't being accomplished, it might be because we are not being discipled ourselves. It takes one to reproduce one. Uh, for those of you who had kids or have had kids before, isn't it interesting how much they're alike you? Uh, the good parts are great, but then they also reproduce all the things in yourself that you may not be so excited about. Um, I think there's a country song. Of course, it would be a country song about <laughs> it's a country, whoever sang it, like talking about how their, their little boy was saying words that they weren't supposed to, right? Um, that's never happened in our household, but that's because I'm a pastor and Jocelyn just goes around um, preaching sermons. No, they look like you. They act like you. An apple tree does not give fruit to bananas. It gives fruit to apples. Because you cannot reproduce something that you are not. Last week I said this statement. I said God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And in that first part of the statement, it's really like, like kind of like a hype statement, right? God does not call the qualified. You mean I don't have to be qualified to be on mission for God? Nope. In fact, when Jesus came to earth and he started his ministry, what did he do? He walked down the seashore and all the people that had been rejected by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said, I'll take you. Those of you that are fishermen that the world has rejected, I'm going to call the unqualified. But what did he do for the next three and a third years? He qualified them. They were qualified to be on the team, but then he spent the next three and a third years teaching them how to be a disciple. You cannot reproduce something that you are not. I, I could say it maybe this way. You cannot pour out of your life what has not been poured into your life. And so I think this is what's frustrating about American Christian culture is we expect that on Sunday for 35 minutes the pastor to pour into us and then we wonder why by the time Monday afternoon hits we're all out and then if you're like me the frustrating part is I was taught well then just read your Bible and pray and then if you'll just read your Bible and pray you'll be okay and then guess what by Monday afternoon I was still out. And then I couldn't wait, and then I'd get filled up on Sunday. I'd get my squirt gun, you know, all filled with water, and let's charge hell again. 
and then life is messy. And it becomes frustrating. And there's a man named, or two men, Peter and John, who were disciples of Jesus. And after Jesus had died, rose again, and ascended into heaven and given the disciples, here's your charge, go and make disciples. They were on mission for Jesus. And they were, as they were ministering, there was members of the council in Acts chapter 4, 13 that saw that when the boldness, or they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they could see that they were what? Ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Now what that means is it wasn't that they weren't trained in the scriptures. It doesn't mean that they were unlearned, meaning they were just dumb. They didn't have any clue of how to do anything. No, that's not what it meant. What it meant was they could tell that they didn't go to special training, that they were just ordinary men. But what did they see? They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. When Jocelyn was younger, she's 13 now, when she was younger, uh, grandma would come and pick her up or we would drop her off in Los Angeles and she would spend a week or two with grandma. And all you grandmas just started smiling, didn't you? Because you know exactly what you do when you pick up grandkids. You spoil them, you teach them the wrong ways of the world, that everything revolves around grandma and grandpa, and that life has no consequences. They can whine and cry, and everything will be okay. And after a week of spending time with grandma, we would have to start all over again with all the training and going to bed at the right time and eating vegetables, and, right? Because you're a product of who you spend time with. And if every kingdom has land, and as we are to conquer the land for Jesus, by the way, not through the sword and not through the pen, but through loving others. If we are to learn how to love like Jesus and how to live like Jesus, then we must be spending time with, with Jesus and in his presence. We cannot, listen, please, and don't take this too harshly, but we cannot call ourselves Christians. We cannot call ourselves followers of Jesus if we are not following Jesus. To follow Jesus, you must be with Jesus. If we say that we're followers, but the following is at a distance, yes, and I know at seasons of our life, it seems like maybe God isn't there and that the presence of God just isn't there. And we do know that God is all around. He's always with us. He gave us his spirit. But if we are not spending time looking at his face, then we, just like Peter and John, no one in our oikos or in the world will be able to tell they may not be the smartest people. They may not have gone to special training, but I can tell you one thing. They've been with Jesus. Later on, after the council argues back and forth with Peter and John. In verse number 19, Peter and John replied to the accusations that were being made against them for preaching the gospel. And they said, do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than him? All of a sudden, we see Peter, who, by the way, was the coward who could not even say Jesus' name or that he had been with him and denied him three times at the end of the gospels. In John chapter 21, Peter's the guy that goes, no, it wasn't me. And by the way, it wasn't a Roman soldier who had a sword at his throat saying, are you with that Jesus guy? It was like a junior high school girl at a fire pit. Nope. Then he resorts to like using filthy language just to prove that he had not been with Jesus. And now we're seeing boldness from Peter and John. Do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than them? They're speaking to people that can put them to death. And then they say this phrase, we cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. You know how many times I, 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 I get the question from people to say, how do you know when you're supposed to tell someone about Jesus? Yes. The answer is yes. Every time. Every time. Every time is a good time. 
We live in a broken, hurting world. We live around people that are searching for truth. They're even, they're even trying reality TV. Someone give us truth, and we sit here with the truth in our hands and the truth in our soul, but the problem is we may not have spent the week in the presence of Jesus, so we don't have the boldness that Peter and John have because we've not been with him. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Remember the first time that you knew you were in love? Girls, you called up your girlfriends and you said, I think I'm in love. I think he's the one. And then when he put a ring on it, then what did you walk around doing? Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Oh, nice to meet you. (laughs) Or let me shake your hand with my left. (laughs) Guys, maybe a little bit different. Maybe, you know, you were playing Call of Duty or something and you're like, hey, by the way, I got engaged. (laughs) Now, I remember when I got engaged to my wife, Man, I made phone calls. I couldn't stop talking about her. I wanted everyone to know who I was in love with. She changed my life. And then as time goes on, we lose the high emotion of our life being changed. And even in marriages, you'll watch, right? We stop spending time in each other's presence. And salvation then becomes this thing where, hey, God, thank you for the gift of eternal life. I've got it from here. I'm good. And then we wonder in our neighborhoods, in our oikos, with our neighbors and our schoolmates and extended family, co-workers, why they don't see anything different about us and why we have such a hard time telling people about Jesus. And it's probably because we're not spending time in his presence. The motivational speaker, Jim Rohn, said this, you are a product of the top five people you spend the most time with. Isn't that the truth? When I would spend time around my four buddies in college doing dumb, stupid, crazy things, you know what I was? Dumb, stupid, and crazy. Sometimes I look back to my college and I go, I did what? What was I thinking? It was because of who I was spending time with. When I got married and going and hitting the gym to play pickup basketball every night wasn't an option anymore, and I wasn't the top, I wasn't a product of the top five players that were on the court with me, and I started spending more time with her, my life started to change. Could it be that maybe we don't want our life to change? Could it be maybe that we're kind of good with where we're at? We still want to be able to do the things we used to do, And still be able to hold the flag of, I'm a follower of Jesus. Because when we spend time with him, you can't help but look like him. I'm here to encourage you, not to shame you. I'm here to say this. There ain't nothing like being like Jesus. And once he starts to change your life... And it becomes less about doing the law or doing the rules because it's a command, but instead knowing that we are his precious treasure like we talked about last week. And that he loves us so much and even in our brokenness, even with our dross, even with our sin, even with our messiness and our mess ups that we do all the time, he said, I'll take you, you, broken people. Jews, Gentiles, anyone, here's the good news. Come to me, you that are weary and heavy laden and need rest. I'll take you. And we say, man, it's so awesome. God calls the unqualified, but here's what he does is he qualifies the called. 
we start the process of becoming more like him and the dross. Yes, we may be gold and we may be that precious treasure, but we come with dross. And so the beautification of the purification process, it doesn't look good, but man, does it feel good. Abraham Lincoln, how many of you remember him? He said this, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. We live in such a culture as like, let's go right away. You know what Jesus did for the first 30 years of his life? Prepare. Prepare. This is not even in my notes. This is, this is a great statement. You ready? <laughs> The preparation is so important because you cannot love someone while you're in a hurry. America is filled with Christians that are trying to build the airplane while it's in the air. And we're trying to love others while we have no time for them. And we're trying to love others sometimes without being equipped. This is how Jesus did it when he was with his disciples, and I'll end with this. He started with doing and letting his disciples watch. So as we become prepared, as we become a resourced land in the upside down kingdom, it's I do, you watch. And then when we disciple others, we do, and they watch. And then Jesus did, and the disciples helped. I do. You help. Some of you have kids, right? You're going, oh yeah, this is the process, right? I do, they watch. Then I do and they watch more. And then they watch YouTube, kids. And then they watch their iPads. And then I do, you help. Number three, you do, I help. And then lastly, you do, I watch. And he empowers us with his spirit So how do we become more like Jesus? How do we spend more time in his presence? Is it as simple as you open up God's word and you just ask the Holy Spirit, right? Give me a passage, right? The problem is when you do that one, right? It's, and then the, Philistine, the Philistines were circumcised. What? I don't know if I can get anything out of that. Solomon had how many wives? It is about reading the word of God. But I think it first starts with this. Number one, take an inventory of who the top five people you spend time with. Who are you spending the most time with? Or could I say this? What are you spending the most time on? What is filling your mind? And then find a purposeful in your oikos. Find someone in your group of friends that is following Jesus and spend time with them. Ask them if you can spend time with them. I promise you if they're a disciple of Jesus, they'll say yes because they know that the goal is discipleship. And then number three, spend time daily with God in his word. And here's how I'm gonna help you do that. Okay, if you're, you're new to just reading through the word of God, I would pick one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John is the first four books of the New Testament. And that is the story of Jesus given in four different accounts from four different men. Uh, I would pick Psalms and Proverbs, read through them as well. And here's what I would do that with. I would do that with a great tool called the Bible Project. Okay, so go ahead and put that slide up, the Bible Project. And I want you to take out your phone and take a picture of that so you can remember it. Some of you may be familiar with this already, but I promise you this is a great tool that as you're walking through the word of God and you're reading the word of God, you're not like, I have no idea what in the world is being said right now. This is confusing. What does that mean? What am I, how am I supposed to take this? What is going on around this? Because the, the Bible is written by over 40 authors and they all write with different styles and they're all written in different ways. 
And so this is a great tool to help you as you read through the scriptures. And they have a, uh, several videos that go along with each passage. And then I would say this, lastly, uh, spend time with Jesus in prayer. If, if, if you have a hard time with that, if you're like, man, I don't, I don't know how to pray. I don't even know where to start. We have a prayer team. This is kind of a, a, a newer team. But even right now, we have someone in our prayer room uh, that is praying through this message. Uh, that uh, they have great resources in there. They can help you. Uh, and, and, and especially if you're just starting your journey with prayer. So it's the prayer room. It's on Sundays. We have signage right here. It's through that hallway. We have, um, by the way, this is open during the week, during office hours. So Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. Our prayer room is open if you want to just pop in um, and, and pray. We have communion available. We have a team on Sundays in both services that can help with that. So that's the message. I don't have like this bombastic end to Upside Down Kingdom. Would you stand with me? Would you do that? In fact, uh, in the first service, they started to dim the lights and I think everyone was, was, was ready for me to go, all right, heads bowed and eyes closed. I love starting or ending my message that way. Uh, my daughter said this to me in, uh, uh, last week. She goes, Dad, when everybody has their head bowed and eyes closed and you are asking people if they've ever made Jesus their king or ever made him your savior and would you raise your hand, are you doing this? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. No, that is not what I'm doing. And if you see me doing that, you're supposed to have your head bows and your eyes closed. <laughs> hey, take advantage of these resources. And, and I would say this to anyone, uh, find someone on our team if you have a question about spending time in the presence of God. We cannot be disciple makers if we are not being discipled, if we're not spending time in his presence. I love you guys. Let's pray and we'll end the series. And then Easter, guys. Let's go. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. All right, here we go. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, your word. And I pray, God, that we would take this time, reflect in our life. Who are we spending time with? What are we putting into ourselves? And uh, Father, if there's something that needs to be removed, I pray that you would uh, reveal that to us and that we would take that dross out, that we'd let your spirit do that. And, and Father, would we spend more time in your presence with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you back here Easter Sunday.